My name is Brenda Brozak, um, and along with my friend and colleague here, Patricia McFarland, we are gonna, we're so happy to be here today presenting to you. Um, we're both nurses, and we're gonna be spending the next 45 minutes talking about nursing, and we're gonna be talking about um, what nurses do. We're gonna look at the current job market and then we're gonna look at some opportunities with the future job market, especially related to the Affordable Care Act. And then we're going to also spend a little bit of time talking about how really to prepare for employment in nursing. So um, again, we're very happy to be here today and if you have any questions, feel free to ask us during our presentation. We wanted to start off by taking a little time and telling you both why we chose nursing as a career. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Pat to start off with that. Great, thanks Brenda. So I'm Pat McFarland, you can see from the slide, I am the CEO of the Association of California Nurse Leaders and the California Student Nursing Association. So I've been a nurse for almost 40 years now, it's hard to say that um, out loud, but it's the truth. Um, I started nursing, I'm an associate degree graduate originally and graduated from the associate degree program in Sacramento, American River. Um, a number of years ago and then became a pediatric ICU nurse. And as a pediatric ICU nurse, I just love caring for the kids, but unfortunately one day one of them died and that was, that was it for me. I thought that's not a specialty for me any longer. Did general uh, ICU for a number of years and went on to get my master's, bachelor's and then master's at UCSF, the number one school of nursing, I believe, in the country. Was then, still is, it's a great school, so yay for UC. Um, I know I'm at UC Davis today, but uh, I'm a UC San Francisco person by, by love, and I became a geriatric clinical specialist. I've held a number of jobs in hospitals. I've been an assistant head nurse, a, a head nurse, nurse manager we call them today, an associate director of nursing, a director of nursing, a clinical nurse specialist. So I've had a number of jobs and I work in associa uh, association management today. Um, really bringing the word and trying to help educate uh, individuals about what nursing does, advocating on behalf of nursing. I work closely with the board of nursing um, in that role, and I just love that. Probably is one of my favorite things to do is work with the Board of Nursing and represent nurse leaders um, across the state at different tables to be sure that nursing's voice is heard, especially today in healthcare redesign. So it's been a wonderful journey. I'm not done yet. I'm still committed to lifelong learning. And like many of you, I'm shopping around looking for that right doctoral program I should go to because it's time of my life. My kids have been educated. Now it's my time for myself. So how about you, Brenda? What do you do? Well, thank you, Pat. Yeah, my journey was much more different different than Pat's. Originally, when I first graduated from college many years ago, I uh, majored in journalism and communications, and I went to work um, in public relations and advertising, did some copywriting. I was really predominantly a writer, wrote for some publications. Uh, but I really, as I was approaching my 30s, I just felt a little disenchanted with my profession, and I felt like I was not doing something that was important enough with my life. So I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I got assigned to write a series of articles about cardiac rehab. So I was matched up with some cardiac rehab nurses and I spent about a week with them, followed them around, saw what they did, uh, interviewed them, interviewed some of the patients, and that was what caused me to fall in love with nursing. I decided this is what I wanna do. So I went back to school and became a nurse, and I guess the cardiac part really made a big impression on me because I went right to work in cardiac care. I, I've always been fascinated with the heart, and cardiac care is such an exciting uh, field because patients come in so sick, and then with our interventional procedures today, they can turn around in as little as a day or hours and, and be up walking around again, so it was a very exciting field for me. Um, I then went into at the staff development side of the hospital and began teaching classes and doing things like that. And then later, I left the hospital and went to work in, uh, for nonprofit nursing organizations and that's where I met Pat and began working with her. So today, I work for myself. I'm a nursing consultant and I've done, um, I do, I work for several professional organizations and I do things like helping them with their message in nursing. So I write articles, I do websites, 
I um, help draft press releases, help them form what their messages are to the public. And so I've really been able to take both of those careers and put them together and do something I love. And one thing I had the opportunity to do was I was able to uh, write a book called You're Hired, and that was for, to help new graduate nurses really figure out how they can get a job in nursing, how they could write their resume, prepare for the interview, and things like that. Uh, and Pat and I, I'm happy to say, are just finishing our second book, which is called Surviving and Thriving, and it's about how to be successful in your first nursing job. So that's coming out later in November. So anyway, my journey was much different than Pat's, but we both share this love of nursing. And here we want to share with you one of our favorite quotes about nursing. Save a life and you're a hero. Save a hundred lives and you're a nurse. And it really is true. As nurses, we have such an impact on per people's lives. It's, it's just really, really amazing what we can do as nurses. So who are nurses and, and what do we do? So I'm going to turn that, this over to Pat and she's going to take over. So for us to describe who we are as nurses, we have to look first at what the definition of nursing is about. So let me be honest, we're not about what you see on TV. We're not about you know, being the handmaiden to the physician. Long gone are those days. So we turn to the uh, professional association that all registered nurses should belong to, the American Nurses Association. And this is the ANA's definition of nursing today. It has evolved over the years. Um, but it's basically what all of us believe about nursing, what we know is the essence of nursing, is that we really promote wellness, we advocate for our patients, we alleviate pain and suffering, and we work with families and individuals to promote their health. Um, so that's a very nice, broad definition of what we do. In California, of course, we also have to work under the auspices of what the Bo Board of Registered Nursing tells us about nursing and what our regulations are. So that's why I like to work with the board, because I like to make sure we stay current in our regulations about nursing practice. So to start off with, in the Gallup poll, we, were the, we are the most trusted of all professions. And we have held that wonderful rank um, every year except for one in recent years. Can anyone tell me why we didn't hold it in the one year? 9-11, we lost out to firefighters that year. We're okay to step aside for the firefighters and what they did. But this is something that has been for us that we as a profession have to really embrace because it's a huge responsibility when the community holds you in such high esteem and high regard. And so we've proven our worth to the communities and so now we must ensure that we continue to hold that high ranking um, line. Did you want to point out the nurse float? Oh, the nurse's float, I forgot. Thanks, Brenda. Um, if you haven't recognized this, this is the nurse's float that was in the Rose Parade this year. And um, I just want to tell you that there was a group of nurse leaders that got together and said, we can do something. The president of the, of the uh, Rose Bowl, um, the whole process was a registered nurse. First time ever we've had a registered nurse be president of that um, group. And so a group of nurses, they were started out in the OR, many of them are um, retired OR nurses and still working in the operating room, brought this forward and part of what I'm so excited and why we included the, uh, the, the picture of the float in this particular slide was because this last week we just released a press release and they over um, recruited dollars, if you will, and there's $125,000 now that are going to be available for student uh, nurses to continue their education. And I'm going to be administering that through the Association of California Nurse Leaders. So every year there'll be a um, scholarship and it will be called the Nurses Float Scholarship. Um, look to any press releases recently because it's just gone out and I'm looking at Philip, one of our uh, student graduates. I think, Philip, you might want to think about this. Philip's in the PhD program here at UC Davis. I had the opportunity to be on the phone with um, uh, Vice President Joe Biden about a week and a half ago. Um, so now you're all impressed, you think he's my great friend, right? No, I was there with about 5,000 other nurses. And he had wanted to call together a group of nurses, so it went out kind of to the, the different organizations across the country, inviting us to join him for a webinar um, uh, on talk about really the healthcare reform, really about educating the community and how we as nurses can lead that education movement. But what I was really impressed with when he said um, during the conversation that it was, physicians allow you to live, nurses make you want to live. Now he can say that from a very solid standpoint because you know he'd had a cerebral hemorrhage um, in his younger days and he spent four months in the critical care area. 
So he was very familiar with what nurses do, and he's a huge advocate for us. It's always good to have political advocates for nursing. It really helps position us well. And I really liked his, his saying that, so I've been using it in my, my talks and everything recently. So just to keep everyone kind of clean on what kinds of nurses and straight on ner different roles nurses have, different licensures we have, um, we actually have uh, licensed vocational nurses, which are vocational nurses. Generally, those individuals are educated in uh, vocational programs. Some will be educated through our community colleges. It's often, for many, the first route into nursing. Maybe they can't afford to be uh, working for four years, I mean, to be going to school for four years before they can get a job. So many individuals will go into vocational nursing, have a good salary that allows them then to continue their education in nursing. Um, we have registered nurses, and registered nurses are Philip, um, Brenda, and myself, we're all registered nurses first. I happen to also be educated to be an advanced practice nurse because I'm a clinical nurse specialist. And I'll explain what an advanced practice nurse is later, but an advanced practice nurse does require a minimum of a master's degree to practice today anywhere in the country. Now, your educational route to nursing can be very different. You can start with an associate degree, like I did. Those were programs that were, came out of a nursing shortage in the 1950s, and we developed associate degree programs at our community colleges across the country. Um, actually, here in, in California, Sacramento City was one of our very first associate degree programs. It was part of the pilot study. We have bachelor's degree um, individuals, and you will receive a bachelor's degree at a college or a university, and you can practice. You can be a generic master's uh, nurse into nursing practice, but you can also um, have a master's degree as a second or third degree like myself. Doctorate in nursing practice, that's probably the fastest growing segment of our nursing education right now. Many, many schools are looking at developing and opening doctorate of nursing practices uh, programs. Uh, many of our advanced practice nurses are looking to get doctorates in nursing practice. The American uh, Academy of Colleges of Nursing, that would be the deans and directors from all our schools of nursing belong to this organization. And a number of years ago, they talked about really elevating the advanced practice nurse to a doctoral level, and it's a doctorate of nursing practice. Entry into some of the other disciplines, pharmacy, um, physical therapy, speech pathology, are all elevating their entry into practice at the doctorate level, the clinical doctorate level, and that's what a doctor of nursing practice is. And of course, other doctoral degrees, the PhDs, uh, the DNS is the doctorate of nursing science, not too many of those programs around anymore. Uh, PhD program uh, over at uh, UC Davis, just starting PhD program at uh, UC San Francisco, UCLA, and UCI, I believe, also have uh, doctorate PhD programs. And I just wanted to mention a little something about master's degrees. Pat and I both have a master's, hers is in nursing, um, but mine isn't because when I worked in staff development, my organization wanted to develop a leadership program for nurse managers, and they wanted me to, to really assist with developing that program. So I chose to get my master's degree in organizational leadership. So really, you know, when you're thinking about advanced degrees, follow your passion and where you think you wanna go, and then that's what will guide you. There isn't any set, really set degree that you need. Um, first you have to, decide your path, and then you see what degree is going to take you there. And I also want to point out uh, this picture is from Sacramento State University's simulation um, program, and they have quite a big simulation lab now. And when Pat and I originally trained as nurses, we didn't have simulation, um, which we, we just practiced on our patients, which doesn't always work as well for them as it does to practice ahead of time in simulation. I was telling the last group that when I gave my first injection, the, the man, I was giving him a, an injection and he was very muscular and I was so nervous. And my instructor behind me kept saying, dart it, dart it, dart it. Well, I thought I did, but it bounced right off his arm and went across the room. <laughs> so, um, so I had to redo that. So anyway, simulation really helps us uh, practice in a confined area uh, and learn, and then we can take it out to the hospital. How many of you are nursing students in the, in the audience here? Anybody? Okay, or so you're thinking about nursing then? Is that what you're thinking about? Okay, okay, well when you do get to your nursing programs then you'll see more about how we use simulation now to really enhance our training. And we use simulation for those of us that uh, need to 
retool ourselves as well. Simulation becomes a very safe environment to practice the art and science of nursing without putting a patient in jeopardy. And it's, it's really um, quite um, interesting what we can do and, and the degree that we can make these um, electronic um, dolls, if you will, um, go into heart failure or pulmonary failure, birth a baby, all kinds of things. So it's just phenomenal what you can do with simulation. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's not just used for students. It's yep. actually used by uh, practicing nurses as well just to sharpen their skills and learn new ones. Yeah, we've even used it recently to help nurses find their voice and, and how to testify before a Senate uh, committee or how to provide um, uh, community forum uh, information or, or how to talk to a reporter because simulation can be used as a controlled learning in a safe environment for everyone. So don't be afraid of it. It's really the, the cutting edge of how to improve the care we give our patients. I think the other thing we should point out on this slide, this slide uh, Brenda, is the more education we have, the more opportunities. Um, there are before us is where you can practice what you can do with it. And let me be sure to be very clear with everyone, this is nursing's time. There has been no greater period in our history of nursing than now for us to make a difference and for try new roles, trying new roles and new, new opportunities. I think it's very exciting. You know, I'm, I've been a nurse for 40 years, so you probably think, oh, she should retire. I don't have time to retire because there's too much we have to do. There's too much fun still to be had in this profession. So I welcome you and I encourage you strongly it's an endless opportunities with nursing. So this is our current healthcare system, and this is a slide right out of the Institute of Medicine's Future of Nursing Report. And it's really critical. It's our roadmap to the future, and we um, nurse leaders today are using this very much to guide where we're going. And you can see our current environment is really built on acute care model, where most of our resources go to care for patients that are in the acute care model. We really don't have a health model, do we? We have a great illness model. We are great at taking care of patients that are very, very ill. Well, we need to flip this upside down. Our paradigm must be to keep people well. And that's what draws me to gerontology and to chronic care is I want to help people stay well with that chronic illness they have. I want to keep the older person out of the skilled nursing facility. I don't want to be in a skilled nursing facility when I get older, so I want to help to put systems in place, and that's nursing's territory. It's really so rich for what we're doing. So where's, what's the employment outlook right now for nurses? So let me just tell you, there's over 3 million of us registered nurses in this country. We are the largest discipline of all healthcare section. We have in California right now about 470,000 registered nurses. About 50,000 of those registered nurses actually don't live in California. So if we look at the fact that we have right around 350,000 registered nurses actively working in California, and that we know by 2030 that we need about 526,000 registered nurses, that tells me that employment outlook looks pretty good right now. Now those of you, uh, if you were in nursing school and getting ready to graduate, the, the opportunity to get a job is a little bit difficult for you, but don't worry because as the economy writes itself, first there are many more of those nurses that are in my generation will start to retire, but also with healthcare reform there's going to be new jobs and new roles. So there'll be wonderful opportunities for you to practice in different environments. But the key here to know is the average age of a registered nurse in California is 56 years old. So you could see you are going to be the generation to lift this work of the Institute of Medicine and take it forward because we need young people driving our profession. So this is where nurses work. Nurses work, predominantly 60% of us either work in the acute care hospital or in a specialty hospital. Again, with that acute focus on illness. About 8.7% of us work in a private practice, a clinic, or some sort of an arena. 5.8 work in home health. Now that's a wonderful opportunity. I was a home health nurse for about a year and a half. And in that arena, you really have to draw on your um, MacGyver skills, if you know what I mean by that. You know, remember MacGyver, he could fix anything anywhere, right? Home health nurse is, that's where MacGyver, I'm sure, got his uh, ideas. Because a home health nurse has to be so creative in meeting the healthcare needs of a person in their home. It was a wonderful opportunity. That's gonna grow in the future. 5.1% um, work in long-term care or what we call post-acute care more often now. That might be the hospital-based distinct part, the acute rehab, 
or um, the freestanding skilled nursing facility. And our goal is really to keep people working and living as optimally to keep them out of the skilled facility in the future. So I'm hoping those arenas will see more, pay, more individuals and in, will be the senior housing areas where they're well and healthy and there are programs there to keep them well and healthy and safe. School nursing, almost 2% of our nursing workforce work as school nurses. And this is important because if you think about the children and our future and the obesity and some of the choices that they're making, if every school had a nurse, just think the impact that would make. Often, the school nurse is the only healthcare provider the children see. Now, in healthcare reform, we certainly hope that will change. But if we have more and more, I think the school nurse is going to change. Um, that role and that opportunity to work there. Sacramento State has a fabulous school nursing program, which is at the master's level. And then about 18% of us work elsewhere, either in associations, for the government, um, in insurance companies, um, faculty in our schools of nursing all come under that category. The other thing we're still predominantly, as we look around, I see a few men here in the audience. Well, the good news is we are starting to change that image and bring more nurses into nursing. I think the current statistics said just a little over 10% of the nursing workforce in California are male. However, in our schools of nursing, it's a little more than 20%. So we are starting to make a difference. When I started nursing, uh, there were no men in my uh, nursing class. And when I started working in a hospital, we uh, did not allow men registered nurses to work anywhere but in the emergency room. So things have really changed, and we are so happy to have that. So I welcome all of you males. In fact, there's a special organization, Men in Nursing. For those of you that are thinking about nursing, please look that up. It's very important. So what are our current roles? Predominantly, when you graduate from, from nursing school, you will become a direct care provider, a staff nurse, something along that role, where you'll be providing care directly to a patient population. Then the next level is it, you move into nursing management, nursing administration. You might hear of a CNO, which is the chief nursing officer, chief executive um, nursing officer. Those are different roles in management we might as, uh, aspire to. Certainly a nurse educator, huge need in our discipline to have more nurse educators, individuals to help prepare that next generation of nursing. And they're going to have to have a different skill set as we move in the future, because more and more of our nurse educators have to be familiar with that simulation technology and other types of technology, because teaching is, is starting to to look different. How we approach and how new things is going to be very different. And then the four categories of advanced practice nurses. Like I mentioned, advanced practice nurses have to have uh, master's degrees. Today, there is a movement for them to have a doctorate of nursing practice in the near future. And there are four levels. A clinical nurse specialist, that's what I was, practice typically in the acute care hospital or long-term care arena. And we manage patient populations. We work directly with staff as an educator, clinician, and researcher. It was basically our role. The nurse midwife, and again, notice this difference. It's a nurse midwife versus a midwife. A midwife is a layperson. A nurse midwife is a registered nurse with uh, an advanced degree. And they often not only do um, childbirth, they often do women's health as well. So very interested if you're into women's health issues, you might find that role of interest. The nurse anesthetist, this is the nurse who administers anesthesia. Um, most of our rural hospitals have nurse anesthetists providing anesthesia for almost 100% of their patient population. Um, this is a very, um, uh, very specific role that they work typically in um, the operating room, although more moving into pain management roles. And I'll tell you a secret, they're the highest paid of all registered nurses. So it's a very lucrative specialty to go into. Never could really tolerate being in, standing in the OR for that long. So it wasn't something that was interest me, but I have several very good friends that are nurse anesthetists. And then nurse practitioners, and I bet most of you are familiar with all of these roles. The nurse practitioner you're most familiar with, you might see a nurse practitioner. Those are advanced practice nurses that practice um, often independently in the community or in a clinic. They may have, be in partnership with physicians, and they prescribe and diagnose and care for populations of patients. And in the future, we're going to see more and more of our advanced practice nurses at the nurse practitioner level to meet the 5.5 million, 5 .5 million uh, recipients that we have. This is what our healthcare model needs to look like in the future. We need to flip that upside down. And we need to do wellness and primary care intervention and chronic care management. And if you go back to what nursing is all about, nursing promotes health, nursing alleviates pain, nursing advocates for the patient, and you could see why the definition of who we are as nursing fits so nice and tightly with this new world of our transformed healthcare system. And we are moving on that road, and many of us are doing uh, a lot of work around how we can get prepared today's workforce for tomorrow's needs. And that's what we've just done. Over the last mm -hmm, 
10 months, I think it is now, we've been working as a community of nurse leaders through the California Action Coalition in partnership with our California Institute for Nursing and Healthcare. And the California Action Coalition is actually the entity in California that's taken on the responsibility to implement the work of the Institute of Medicine's report, Future of Nursing. And so our California Institute for Nursing and Healthcare, which is our workforce center here in California, received funding from a foundation to really look at the future roles. They went out, they held meetings across the state, they talked with, worked with, and interviewed over 300 individuals in healthcare, consumers, providers, insurers, and said, what are the roles that we need to start preparing our nurses for the future for? And they came up with these five roles, is where nursing will expand for the future. And the first one is care coordinator. And this will be an individual that really manages patient populations across the continuum of a facility. They, they will uh, make sure that the handoffs, that's what we call when we pass one patient from this level of care to that level of care or from this discipline to that discipline to this specialist to that specialist, that there's nothing that's ever dropped, that it's continuous and people understand what the patient's needs are and the patient is always at the center of the focus. And we will see more care coordination by registered nurses. We will see more of our education being done in the community with faculty team leaders really leading that interdisciplinary education of our nurses of the future. One of the things the Institute of Medicine said early on about as we prepare and change our healthcare environment and striving for uh, better quality and patient safety is that healthcare discipline professionals all must uh, be integrated and socialized together and therefore having more interdisciplinary education. And so as we prepare nurses of the future, they will be educated alongside a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, speech pathologist, physicians, pharmacists, and other healthcare disciplines. And we will need a faculty member kind of to oversee that. And my truth of the world has always been that nursing is the glue of the healthcare team. We know when to bring in disciplines and hand off and make sure everything is there because we're there 24 seven with the patients. This is a fabulous new role for a faculty member. Um, informatics and specialists in the informatics area. Technology is difficult for me because I didn't learn by technology. Many of you came to your nursing and came to college already very proficient at using technology, finding it not as a challenge, but as an opportunity. So I've had to really take that challenge for me to learn technology and make it an opportunity so that I can use it. But you will understand technology to a degree so different than our generation does, you will take us even farther. And so I've been working with a company that actually has a smart pill, and I'm on the board. We're one of three nurses on that board. And this smart pill actually, if compounded or mixed with other medications, it's smaller than a nanosecond of a, of a, a grain of sand, will help us monitor a patient's adherence to medication administration, to their diet. We can actually, we're looking to uh, roll this out into the heart failure population right now. And we can actually tell when the patient is headed for trouble before they get in trouble so we can stop that and intervene. It's very exciting and it all feeds back what onto my smartphone or to my iPad and I can track that patient um, by that um, device after they swallowed that little pill. It's being used in um, England now in their outpatient arena and it's being used to help monitor and control uh, adherence to TB medications in China. It's been approved here first in, in the United States and the companies in the Bay Area. Very exciting to be there. Um, and then there's lots of other technology as well. There's uh, something that healthcare providers are using a lot now are robots. These robots have a big screen and they send them home with a patient they might be worried about for a week or two or as long as is needed. And then the physician, the nurse can interact with the patient. They can visually see them. Um, oh, you're worried about this bump on your arm? Show it to me and they can monitor and assess them from, um, from their office and the patient doesn't have to come into the office all the time. So it's really a great way to um, bring the care into the home and make it easy for the patient. Those robots, you may have heard of them too. Some, we have some children who are so allergic that they can't go to school. They're, they have such severe allergies that they, they just can't attend school or they would go into anaphylactic shock. So they send the robots to school for them and then they from home can watch the lessons, ask questions. Uh, you may have seen, there's a couple of commercials about that on TV that you may have seen. So lots of great ways to use technology to really care for our patients and keep them healthy. Right, and to ensure that, that, that it's used right and we have the right technology, we need nurses helping to design that technology. 
because we don't want technology misappropriately designed. Another new role will be the nurse or family cooperative facilitator. That'll be somebody that's really advocating on behalf of the, the patient that may be virtual in person, even using some of these technologies that we were talking about, um, so that we can monitor groups of patients and advocate on behalf of them and make sure they make it through the system. Um, maybe families might even hire some of these individuals, and you would be the advocate for that family to ensure that their health and wellness is optimally um, maintained. And then, of course, the primary care partners. Um, there's no question with 5.5 million Californians needing health care and that will come into the health care system with health care reform that there is opportunity for nurse practitioners to serve as primary care providers. And we're moving in that direction. We are partners with the full uh, uh, complement of health care disciplines to do that work. Okay. Well, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. And we've talked to you about the current job market, and then some roles we see in the future. So now let's take a little bit of time and talk about how to prepare for uh, the workforce and how to successfully get a job as a nurse. Uh, so I'm going to give you some tips. Now, um, some, many of these will work for really for any profession, not just nursing, but we're going to be talking about nursing here today. So first of all, you want to build a work history. So whether you're in nursing school or you're thinking about going to nursing school, um, ideally, of course, you'd want to get some uh, work experience in a healthcare setting, but that's not something that you absolutely have to do. Really think about what things would an employer be interested in? What kind of skills? So sometimes people say to me, well, I've only worked at Starbucks, and how's that going to help me get a job as a nurse? Well, what's Starbucks famous for? Well, besides, co yeah, coffee and what's that? Customer service, yes. And hospitals are very, very interested in hi hiring nurses or employees that have strong customer service skills. So anytime you have whatever job you have, think about what kind of qualities or, or what kind of experiences from that job would my next employer be interested in. Okay, um, excel in academics. If you're trying to get into nursing school, it's very competitive, and so um, being having a high GPA and excelling in ap academics is really gonna help you. When you're in nursing school, there are some communities, um, especially in the Bay Area and Southern California, and in other places where they're really looking at graduates who have a 3.5 GPA or higher. So. So you really have to work and excel at academics, and then um, if you have a good GPA, then put that on your resume. Volunteer in community and healthcare settings. Um, you know, you might not be able to get a job in healthcare, but there's lots of volunteer opportunities. There's health fairs, there's shot clinics, there's all kinds of things where you can get experience, and that just helps you in to have some things that you can put on your resume. Volunteer for the Red Cross, you know, community organizations, maybe take a leadership role in a community organization. All that is really key when you're looking for a job. And then join organizations or clubs that are related to the healthcare field you're interested in. So if you're interested in nursing um, and you go to a school that has a nursing program, they usually have a chapter of the National Student Nurses Association on campus, or you can join the national organization. Or I've talked to other people today where they're, they belong to other healthcare related groups. So look and see what the opportunities are and join those organizations and get involved. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about what employers are looking for when they hire people and really this will help you in any field, not just nursing. First of all, whatever the job is, the employer wants to know that the person they hire is going to have a basic competence to do that job. So if it's nursing and it's a new graduate, they have a level, does that person have a level of basic competence? Now, if they're looking at somebody who's been a nurse for 10 years, for a job, of course, they're going to expect a higher level of competence from that person. So they, they kind of have an idea of where the person's at in their nursing career of what that basic level of competence should look like. Um, is the person dependable and reliable? That's one of the main things any employer is interested in. Are you going to show up for work on time every day? Can I count on you? I mean, that is just the basics in any, any job. 
And that's where having a work history helps you, again, because you have this, this work history and you have these uh, former employers that can, can vouch for you and say that you are reliable and dependable. Um, are you a good fit for the team? This is so important. So many employers really want people who are going to be a good fit. They don't want people who are going to cause conflict on the team or anything like that. And so I don't know if any of you know this or have been exposed to this yet, but when you start applying for jobs in nursing and many other professions, when you go to those online applications, they're going to make you take some uh, assessment tests online. One of them is kind of a personality assessment, um, how you react in different situations. And what they're trying to gauge is, is this person going to be a good fit for our team? Are they going to have good customer service skills? Has anybody taken one of those? Oh, some of you have. OK. I mean, my daughter's going to school in, at San Diego State, and she applied for a job at a pizza parlor and had to take 100 question tests in that area. So really interesting to see that it's even at the level of a pizza employee now. So you can go online, and you can Google personal assessment tests for employment, and you can get some practice tests that you could take. So you might want to try those before you start applying for jobs. Um, is the person committed to our hospital or our organization? You know, sometimes hospitals get employees who just want to work there for a year or two and get some experience so they could really go work for where they want to go work where they want to work. So they really want to find people who are committed to them and committed to staying. Um, communication skills. This kind of goes uh, back a little bit to the good fit for the team, but does, can the person communicate well? Can um, they resolve conflict? And especially in healthcare, communication is so important. The, the Joint Commission, which is a group that accredits hospitals, has said that statistically that over 60% of medical errors are related to communication issues, poor communication. Can you believe that? Over 60%. So if we can communicate better, in the healthcare setting, we could reduce errors. So it's really a key, key area. Is the person customer patient focused? I mentioned that a little bit earlier. And then is, is the person's values in line with our organization's mission and vision? So those are the things that really pretty much any employer would look at. So if you keep that in mind when you're looking for jobs, that can really help you. So how do you um, promote yourself to employers? One of the things I strongly recommend, no matter what job you're applying for, is to sit down and do a personal inventory. Even if you have a resume or what, whatever, sit down and think about, what do I have to offer? So many times I've heard people say, who are new graduates and don't have a lot of work experience in whatever field, they say, oh, what do I have to offer? It's so competitive out there. I don't." I don't have very much work experience. Well, you, I want you to get that out of your head right now. Each of you are unique individuals. You have unique talents and unique skills. You have enthusiasm. You're motivated. You have passions in different areas. So think about those things. You have a lot to offer. And really think about what is it that I have that makes me unique. Don't think about what you don't have. Think about what you do have. So take this personal inventory. First of all, start with what HR people call hard assets. So that's like where you went to school, what degree you have, what's your work experience, you know, all those really quantifiable things, any special certifications or skills that you might have. And then also think about what they call your soft assets. So again, those are your motivations, um, your passions, what you're interested in. For example, um, I've interviewed a lot of nurses, and I've sometimes interviewed nurses who have been nurses for 20 or 25 years, and they have great looking resumes, but they're really not, um, they're just kind of wanting one more job before they retire, and their career's kind of winding down, and they're not very enthusiastic or really wanting to go the extra mile. And then there might be someone else interviewing who's a new grad who's really wants, is so motivated, so enthusiastic, and really wants to get out there 
and work and is very passionate about whatever the field of nursing is, you know, a lot of times that person will get that job if you can show your motivations and your enthusiasm. So write all those things down and then when you have your personal inventory, if you have a resume, go back and look at it and compare it to this inventory and see if you've included everything and you might have to do some tweaking. If you don't have a resume, then this is where you could start to build one. Can, can you go back one? I think we might, was there one other thing on there? That, oh, and then um, always think about, this is kind of marketing 101. Remember my background is marketing and advertising is the basics of marketing are you figure out what your customer needs, you analyze your product, and then you show the, um, the customer how your product meets those needs. So when you're looking for a job, who's the product? You are, right. So kind of get into that mindset of figuring out what the employer needs, do some research, look on their website, talk to people who work there and figure out what does that customer need and how do I meet those needs? And, um, and that's one way that you can really promote yourself. Okay, so again, I want you to, I wanna make the point, really think about what makes you stand out. Don't focus on what you don't have, focus on what you do have. Okay, and I wanna end with one thing that's kinda new. I've, I've kinda added this to my presentations in this area because I've talked to many HR people and it's gotten to be a really big issue that um, lots of employers, before they hire someone, they go to Google and they Google your name and see what comes up. And they go onto your Facebook page and see if they can get on there and see what they can see. So really think about social media is a great tool and I have my own Facebook page and I'm on LinkedIn and I um, have a Twitter that I don't use very much, but I'm not saying that I'm not being negative about social media. I think they're great tools. But really think about how you're portraying yourself in social media. And if there's something on your Facebook page that you wouldn't want a potential employer to see, then take it off, okay? And then Google yourself and see what comes up because sometimes things that other people have posted about you will come up and you wanna, you wanna get those off too if they're not presenting you in the image that you would like to be presented in. Okay, any questions about anything we've talked about today? Oh, yes. So the question is, is that um, if you get your bachelor's degree in nursing, which actually comes with a public health certificate that you apply for um, after that, you, um, so you have a public health class and then you apply for this public health certificate as at the BSN level, and then would, um, you, would you need anything else uh, to work with foster kids or would you need to work in the hospital first? Um, you know, I'm really not sure about that. They may want a little bit of some kind of experience. It might not necessarily be acute care. I would, I would go on to the public health sites and, and take a look at that and see what their job requirements are. Do you have Yeah, any? I think you have to look at specifically where you're going to work yeah. and think about building your toolkit. So if you're going to be out there working with children, do you really, have you really seen children in acute distress and able to understand and offset some of those issues? And so having that experience in pediatrics might be wonderful for your career growth. Also in California, um, don't get public health mixed up with community health, because if you work in uh, for a home health agency, um, there is a requirement that you have a minimum of one year of, of nursing experience in an acute care hospital before you work in home health. However, we've developed some transitional programs in California, and if you work for an employer that's part of that transitional programming, then they guarantee that they will have a mentor available for, to you for that first year. I think as we move out, we, we're really growing these transitional care programs. Those are programs to really take the student from newly graduate and help them simulate into, uh, simulate into the profession. And so over the course of the next few years, I think we'll see more of those and you'll have that opportunity. But public health is a wonderful arena to go into. Mm -hmm. uh, I just can't say strong enough. And we didn't even mention military nursing. That's another great arena that might give you a little bit more leverage there as you go forward. So great choice. Yes.
No, that you're talking, he's, yeah, he's saying his experience, he's heard that you, to continue your education, you do not have need work experience. And this is true, but this is specifically for going into a work experience environment. And you're absolutely right, because I'll give you an example. When I went to get my master's, you could not enter. I went to a special program for associate degree grads, two MS, we had our bachelor's along the way. You had to have a minimum of two years of experience as a registered nurse before they'd even interview you. You know, but now today's different. And if I may pick on my friend Philip, who's one of my mentees, I always like to brag about Philip when he shows up when I'm around. He was on the California Student Nursing Board a couple of years ago. Philip is in the PhD program now. Um, he knew his career path early on, and he set his eyes. And I am so pleased because we need more males and more Hispanic males as uh, PhD educated nurses. And Philip started that journey, and he is well on his way right now. And he's a prime example of what you're saying. You do not have to wait for experience to continue your education. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes, and, and actually, you know, Philip did have his career path planned, but if you don't, that's okay. And that's yeah. the great thing about nursing is you can try something for a year or two and decide, oh, maybe I don't like this area of nursing. I'm going to try something else. So it's really um, a great field where you can switch gears a lot if you wanted to. Yep. Otherwise, um, I would still maybe be a pediatric ICU nurse today if I hadn't had so many opportunities or maybe not gone into another specialty because I was so distraught after that child's death and found my home in gerontology because I had a grandmother that lived to be 102. And I, I, can I just add one more thing on the public health too? Why don't you contact, um, you can contact someone in, in the public that's a public health nurse and ask them for their advice on that idea. Yeah, good. Oh, so there's okay. been some people available okay. for you today. Wonderful. Good. Always good to call. And if you don't know, give us a call. We, we'll, we'll hook you up with somebody. We know a lot of people. And someone else had a question? Yes. Really quick, sorry. Um, we're running out of time for recording. So um, if we could actually move our Q&A outside, that would be ideal. Oh, thank yeah, you. thank you so much. Could oh, we give them okay. a round of applause? Thank you, thank you very much.